Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 27, Anniversaries, Earnings, and the Boss. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my radiant and wonderful co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Michelle? Tired, but okay. How are you? Busy day, huh? Busy day running around from here and there. Well, we have a busy podcast for us as well. Of course we do. <clears throat> Lots of stuff going on today. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're going to talk in our Disney Detective about some news surrounding the uh, Haunted Mansion and its uh, anniversary or birthday, depending on how you want to uh, label it. Then we'll talk a little bit about Disney's uh, Disney Plus bundling of their services now, which... Mm-hmm. You know, the fact that they're coming up with new pricing already and the service hasn't even launched yet. That's yeah. a shocker. Then we have uh, some information from Disney on what the future of Hollywood is and how they're trying to set the pace for that. And from there, we'll go into our entertainment news. We have some Lady Gaga news. <clears throat> we have some Bruce Springsteen news. And we have two of our favorite... Uh, British uh, actors, actresses Mm -hmm. teaming up for a new uh, Netflix show. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Shall we get into it? Let's do it. Go for Disney Detective. So just the other day, my all-time favorite attraction in Disney turned 50, and that would be... The Haunted Mansion. Yes, it would. I was waiting for you to do some wah ha ha. I, you know, I didn't have anything. Yeah. Actually, wait, wait, I still. Oh, hold on. Oh. No. No. No, I Maybe didn't. Not. Oh, uh, wait, wait, this one. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. See? Okay. There we go. I knew I had it queued up from before. <laughs> so, you know, what? what's you know great about this ride is that it's it's timeless. In, in some respects and you know some of the the gags and effects are still you know 50 years later still awes people you know when they when they go well, on the ride and some of the effects that they use were a hundred or more years right old they weren't even the new yeah. new at the time um, but the article was was interesting um, because you know if you're not a, a big fan of the haunted mansion or or know its history um, the haunted mansion was actually a concept that Walt Disney himself had before the park even opened when you look at original sketches and ideas he always wanted to have some sort of haunted attraction and it kind of went through different evolutions uh the original one was supposed to be a walkthrough um it was supposed to be the museum of the weird so it had a very uh different take on it um and it was actually one of the rides that when the park first opened Opened, they actually, you know, had uh, um, a few years, you know, later they put a sign. They had the facade for the haunted mansion up, but it wasn't until 1969 that it actually. It, it was actually in 1963 that the the exterior had been constructed in um, New Orleans Square in Disneyland, but it wasn't until. 1969 that the ride actually opened so well, it took a little th- while to round up all the ghosts well that's the whole thing and they had you know the sign saying that you know they were looking for people you know ghosts to move in but when you think about now how how much faster you know they build things 
you know, like you know about something like, you know, Galaxy's Edge. We've known for a couple of years that it was going, but, you know, <coughs> over time, it, you know, it didn't take that long. So there was all this anticipa- anticipation, you know, for the ride. And that still to this day, it holds up with any of the newer rides, really. Um and they've done a, a several of several updates to the ride right. over they've, the years. Right, they've changed a couple of things of and and you know modified and and brought things in and and obviously as we know and as we've talked about in a number of uh, podcasts before during the holidays for Disneyland they modify it with um, Nightmare Before Christmas characters and and things like that. Um, so that's, you know, a little change that they kind of do, but they, they put it back. Um, they recently just had in Disneyland, as we had mentioned, again, a couple of podcasts ago, the Haunted Mansion party that was a, 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 a separate ticket price uh, for the four-hour party. I had a, a handful of friends, Disney friends that went to it and saw pictures of it and it looked like it was really fun they had a ton of characters walking around for photo ops and and things like that and you know people went on the ride multiple times and you know they had little hidden things you know in in the ride for you to to notice and stuff but you know all in all it was you know a a cool event and and just kind of nice to to see that you know 50 years later the ride, you know, still still stands as as one of the top attractions, you so know. In what the are park. they doing for the fiftieth anniversary? Are they doing anything special? Mm, a lot of merchandise. A lot of merchandise. That <laughs> There's sounds a very Disney. A lot, a lot of special merchandise, and originally, a lot of the merchandise you had to pre-order before the event, and now they're making not only a lot of it, um, some of it was exclusive for just the party, but now they're making a lot of it available, not only in California, but even in Florida, in Walt Disney World, you'll be able to get some of the special 50th anniversary merchandise there, which I think is kind of, you and know, kind of there's cool. always eBay. There's <laughs> Yes, there is always eBay. Um, so yeah, uh, I now I did post a cool video um, from I believe it was the Disney Park blogs on our Facebook page. Um, so if you haven't gone to it or liked it, um, please do, and you can see the the it's a cute little five minute um, haunted mansion video about you know a little bit of the history that you know some of this article you know talks about as well so very cool yeah so happy birthday haunted mansion (laughs) so what else did we have so as you had mentioned disney announces that hey we haven't even started disney plus yet but we're gonna give you a package deal Um, So earlier this week, they had announced that the company was going to be doing a bundle of three of their streaming services. It would be Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus for the low, low price of $12.99 a month, starting, obviously, November 12th, when Disney Plus is supposed to go live. Um, So the company had previously hinted about a bundle of all the three services, but it wasn't until... Uh, Mr. Iger had made it official during the company's investors call the other day. Uh, at twelve ninety nine, the bundle the bundle is cheaper or on par with competitive streaming services, including Netflix and Amazon Prime, um, and it's actually cheaper than HBO's Max, which is rumored to be a price of sixteen or seventeen dollars a month. Uh, Hulu is currently available for five ninety nine with ads. And ESPN co- ESPN Plus costs four ninety nine a month. Um, obviously, for those that don't know, ESPN is owned by Disney. Um, and what, what isn't owned by Disney? <laughs> um, NBC. <laughs> I had to think. I was going to say Fox. I was like, nope, they own them now. Um, so, you know, is it something where? You know, it's going to be worthwhile for everybody. Like for us, the sports, we, you know, we could care less about that. Well, and what does ESPN Plus offer? Does it actually offer live 
sports? And if it does, does it, it offer your local sports? Well, like? it's going to carry hundreds of uh, Major League Baseball, hockey, um, Grand Slam tennis, top-ranked boxing, PGA sports, college sports, international rugby, cricket, the full library. Oh, well, hell, you sold me on the rugby <laughs> and the cricket. But do they have curling? That's what we need. You, you give me curling <laughs> network and I'll get it. Um, so I guess... You know, the idea is more so for also people that that you know cut the cut the cord too. Here's a chance to actually get you know some sports. So uh, the bundle will include the standard ad supported tier of Hulu, not the more expensive no commercials plan or Hulu with live TV. But I'm sure they'll have a bundle coming out for but even more money. But that's what in they're saying months. is that they're thinking that there's probably going to be some sort of upgrade that you can do to get the pricier Hulu subscription. Right. It'll be similar to their to their annual passes, I'm sure. Right. Within a year, it'll be so confusing, you'll need a PhD to figure it right. out. Right. If you want this one, it's 12 bucks. If you want this one, it's 15 If you want well, this one, it's And I'll guarantee you they won't a la carte it. They'll package it just like the oh, cable yeah, networks yeah. package their yeah. stuff now. Yeah. So yeah. you won't be able to say, all right, give me the high-end Hulu, but don't give me ESPN Plus and cut the price. They're not going to do that. Right, right. So, you know, really what was kind of the only thing that the, the article talked about about what was unclear was, um, for example, it's not available in Canada, but they want to bring it to international markets. No way. <laughs> so, you know, other than that, you know, it, it looks like they're they're moving forward with with that and it should be uh interesting to see you know what kind of response they get for for adding that together as a bundle and what the next bundles so what did they know, originally they... announce the disney plus at? 7.99 I thought? all right so we're up to 12.99 with a bundle now right so probably by launch maybe it'll be 20 bucks mm. the way that they're going i don't know i don't know the problem, still, the problem that they have is you don't know what the content's going to be or what the quality of the content's going right. to be. Right. And is it something where you kind of wait a couple of months to see, exactly. you know, what it is? And, you know, like we currently have Hulu. Right. Now, I know I don't watch anything on Hulu. I don't know if there's anything. Hulu is usually like the third string. If there's nothing on Netflix and there's nothing on Amazon, I turn right. to Hulu. So, like, for us, because we're already paying, I'm guessing... Five ninety nine a month for Hulu, right? And if we're gonna pay the seven ninety nine for Disney, if and when we decide to do it, we might be one of these people that gets the bundle just to you know save a couple of bucks. That would annoy me. I know it would. <laughs> just the fact that I I'm even contemplating subscribing to Disney Plus is annoying me already. Like you're I can already, already starting feel to get the... that bile start to creep up my throat <laughs> that I'm giving them money on a regular basis. <laughs> oh goodness! So hey, let's move on to our next story and really get oh, you this get is, you going. I'm glad we see the, the, <laughs> the best for last here. And this isn't even the, the article that you really wanted to talk about, but I'm sure you're gonna. That's right. I'm gonna work it in. Anyway. I I know you totally are. So obviously, during this big, um, you know, uh, third quarter earnings meeting that they had uh, on the sixth. Basically, Disney, you know, came and said that we had a hundred and seventy million dollar loss that basically came from the under underperforming Fox Films division that's now part of them, um, and it really wasn't a surprise. Everybody kind of knew. Um, so uh, uh, the fundamentals of Disney are strong and certainly staying strong," um, said the CEO of Media. Uh, media consultancy company uh, Carmel Group. He says, I know uh, too many people who wouldn't argue that they're getting stronger. However, with the quarterly report, one company effectively set an agenda for Hollywood's future. Big movies belong in the theater, and a theatrical original is a prestige uh, play. Um, so everything else, though, really should be put on the streaming networks. So is anything going to change? Possibly. So Iger basically spoke and said that his company had a loss and it was a big one. He says, however, it's deemed from the acquisition of a movie studio that was in worse shape than he had hoped. And he wanted to make it clear that uh, 
that had nothing to do with the Disney agenda, which had already seen eight billion in box office just this year. Um, he said, I'll note that the performance of the Disney film studio continues to be incredibly strong. This quarter's theatrical slate, which included Avengers Endgame, Aladdin, Toy Story 4, and the carryover success of Captain Marvel, drove the higher worldwide theatrical results compared to what was also an outstanding slate of films during the third quarter of last year, which was Infinity Wars, Incredible 2, and Black Panther. While the only overperforming Fox title that he mentioned by name was, uh, I'm sorry, the underperforming uh, film was the flop Dark Phoenix. Others were um, um, were Stupor and Breakthrough, which were f- um, smaller films, and then. Um, then, of course, there's a film that's coming out that came out this weekend, The Art of Racing in the Rain, which I guess they were hoping that's a dog movie. <laughs> um, so they're hoping that that kind of brings things up. But basically, Fox just hasn't really had much success in, in the movies, you know, recently. Um, so he said that, you know, of course, this won't happen again on Disney's watch. Fox is going in a new direction, and we're going to apply the same discipline and creative standards behind the success of Disney, Pixar, Marvel, and Lucasfilms. And if those movies are good enough, they'll go to theatrical. Otherwise, they're going to Hulu and Disney+. Plus. <laughs> Which will just keep increasing prices on when we keep putting theatrical releases on it. Right, right. So, you know, they're, they're already looking at remaking some classic movies um and as far as i know these are because there isn't an, a, a creative thought left in disney we have to keep <sighs> recreating but it's everybody ones. though it's not just disney um so they're looking to do a home alone series night at the museum cheaper by the dozen and diary of a wimpy kid and basically remaking because that did so well the first time yeah right? of course so those are supposed to be go- coming to disney plus in the years um, that follow, well, so and they have to though because they literally have have nothing no else content right now. to put on Disney Plus, right? And and I'm hoping <clears throat> though that they're gonna get some creative, you know, a, juices flowing and actually, you know, come up with with something, you know, on their own. And the rest of the the article basically talked about you know what we were were just talking about with the the bundle package and you know the price and being you know comparing it to Netflix and hoping to you know well, see rival what them. I f- what I find this interesting about this is this goes hand in hand with the other article that I had read which we're not highlighting today because if we did I probably would like have an aneurysm. <laughs> But, and, and maybe that's why I didn't do it. <laughs> but they come out with their earnings report. They talk about this loss. And what does Iger do? He starts pointing the finger. Mm-hmm. It, it's everybody else's fault right. except his own. Mm-hmm. Um, so the other article itself talked about performance at the parks. Right. And how they took a loss in mm-hmm. Disneyland. Well, they took a loss in Disneyland. He blamed it on... Um, People were staying away from it because because Star Wars opened. Right. Which was the exact opposite of what he had said prior to the opening mm-hmm. was that we're going to have all this attendance. All these people are going to be here. We're going to make millions of dollars. Right. That's what he told investors last year mm-hmm. when prior to launch. Right. So then he complained, pointing the finger at the local businesses, the local hotels, saying, oh, Who's well, started charging they were expecting much. all these people to show up. So they, they jacked up their price. Then he kind of off the cuff remarked, and we kind of uh, uh, increased our prices too. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, we go back to one of the stories with Abigail Disney commenting on the fact that this guy's making $156 million this year. Mm-hmm. And when she pointed out the absolutely ludicrous disparity between Bob Iger and the average park employee mm-hmm. at Disney. Right. Disney came out and said, oh, well, we're this successful. We're a multi-billion dollar company because of all the things that Bob Iger's doing. So so all of our success is due to Bob Iger. But apparently none of the failure is due to Bob Iger. Right. So he's only making the good decisions. The $170 million that they lost in films 
He had nothing to do with that? Right, because those were movies that were already made by the time we bought it, so we had nothing to say. Because it's worth noting that Iger was instrumental in the deal to acquire Fox. Right. Which is their loss leader right now. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where you can't play just one side of the coin. If you're going to claim credit, you've got to to claim credit for the failures, too. Right, absolutely. And it should be reflected in Mm -hmm. in his compensation. Yep. You know, you can't make a hundred and sixty million dollars a year or whatever he's making and, and have a hundred and seventy million dollars in losses. Right. You know, at that point in time, you're three hundred million dollars in the hole because of this guy's decisions. Right. And I'm sure if they did a a pay cut, he wouldn't be hurting for it. No. You know, it, uh, not when you're taking that home angle. Yeah, really. yeah. You don't you don't need what they don't need a pay cut. What they do is they need to get rid of Iger and get somebody in well, there that knows what they're doing. And I'm sure there are plenty of people that that agree with you with that and you know. So that his time is has come. So we'll see. So that's all we have for Disney Detective? That's all because I didn't want you to have an aneurysm. All right, yeah, my blood pressure's already <laughs> going up here. Do we need to get the EKG monitor going uh, on your watch? And let's check uh, it out. let's move on to entertainment news. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, this I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so Lady Gaga is now accused being accused of copying Shallow. Um, her lawyer claims. Um, so it seems that the her Oscar winning and Grammy winning song Shallow from A Star is Born um, there's a lawsuit that might be filed against her um, because songwriter Steve Rosen has accused her of copywriting one of his compositions um, and he believes that there's a three note progression from his song from 2012 called Almost and he's saying that it's it's similar, obviously. Um, wow, but three notes? Three, th- just three notes. God forbid you use the same three notes. Because, you know, there's only so many <laughs> notes to begin with. Um, but, however, a source uh, told Us Weekly that multiple musicologists actually reviewed the two songs and found that there were no material similarities. Um, the insider adds that the melodic combination... Let, let me stop you there for just a second. What is a musicologist? Oh, obviously somebody, somebody that who studies, counts notes. <laughs> studies music, I'm guessing. <laughs> I've never heard the term musicologist. <laughs> Maybe I'm just an uncultured swan. Well, we'll we won't so. Uh, so anyway, they they basically listened to the, you know, the combinations and said that, you know, something was, you know, that the the melodic combination is common and be can be heard in tracks from centuries ago. Um, so Lady Gaga obviously is outraged by these false claims and has decided that she's not going to back down. So according to Page Six, uh, Gaga could actually face a lawsuit stemming from the um, alleged similarities to the melodies. Um, and obviously, this kind of comes on the whole you know, um, ish, uh, the, I can't think of the word, um, because we just had the Katy Perry story, right, um, right. you know, and she actually lost the lawsuit, um, and she's paying out, you know, the $2.78 million, um, as a result Which of sure that. Which a drop in the bucket for her. Yeah. So basically now they're, you know, kind of putting together their case, you know, in case it does actually, you know, go to court, but it, you know, kind of makes you wonder, you know, who's the next one that's going to, you know, have something, you know, pop up and, you know, and have, uh, you know. Well, and it, you know what? It makes me wonder, what does it take to sue in this company? You know, there are frivolous The company or the country? The country. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, what company do we have? Yeah, we're not, we're actually not a company, so that wouldn't really make sense. Um But, like, there are frivolous lawsuits constantly Mm -hmm. in this country. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And to come out here and see someone who's successful, who who has obviously millions of dollars behind them. Right. And basically to sue them under the guise of, you know, either it's going to cost you millions of dollars to defend it. Mm -hmm. Or you're just going to settle and and pay me off to go away. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why do we allow that in our legal system? Right. 
and yeah. and and I'm hoping that if this does get before a judge and you have you know one of the musicologists or whatever you know play the two songs and be like yeah they're different you know well, see and that's and the that's thing a- like in the UK for instance mm-hmm. if you sue someone in the UK and you lose you have to pay their court costs as a result of that you have far fewer frivolous lawsuits yeah oh I'm sure because nobody wants to have to pay out exactly you would think you know and I'm sure if that were the case here probably so many you know. Like this would be something Judge Judy should listen to. Like exactly. that's really like, this should this should be on like daytime TV court because it's three notes. I can understand if it's, you know, and and even with the Katy Perry song, you know, it, it was a riff. I think is what it was. It wasn't even you know the whole song. Okay, if it's a part of a song, honestly, what are the chances? Again, there are so many notes that. Well, and that's you know, the thing. that are out there in the world Generally, to be able to... the grounds for this type of thing is, are you confusing Lady Gaga's work with the original work? Right. With three notes, what human being in the world is going to confuse someone? You couldn't even give me those three notes and let's, and you know, name that tune. Right, and you and would say, oh, tune. I'm going to say it's this other song from 2012, not right. Lady Gaga's song from last year. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So this should be thrown out immediately. Yeah. So so we'll see. So, all right. On to good news, though. In the right. So this industry. was actually kind of kind of cool. Um, so there's this new movie out called Blinded by the Light. Um, and what was cool, I knew that they were doing this premiere locally uh, in New Jersey because it, it's basically about. Um, these kids who start listening to um, Bruce Springsteen music and he gets inspired by it, um, kind of a coming of age thing. So they were doing a premiere of the movie in Asbury Park. And as a surprise, Bruce Springsteen actually showed up to the premiere. Which he's been known to do. Right, right. And what was cool was um, I know that one of our local radio stations was actually giving away tickets and they were hiring a bus to actually drive people to the premiere since it was in Asbury Park, since it wasn't, you know, that they had to to go uh, that far away. Um, So the movie premiered at the Paramount Theater on Wednesday night in Asbury Park. And after... um, Arriving with his wife, the film's director, and her family were there. The singer actually delivered a surprise performance after the screening. So the rocker performed four songs and was joined on stage by Southside Johnny and the Asbury Dukes. Um, and together they played Talk to Me. Jukes. The Jukes. Asbury I'm sorry. Jukes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was reading it too quickly. God, you New Yorkers. Ew. <laughs> Don't even start. <laughs> Um, so they, they did a couple of songs together. Um, so the movie is actually based on a memoir by, um, I'm not even going to try and say his name because I'll, I'll completely, uh, kill it where it was, uh, greetings from Burry Park and it premiered at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival where it had merged as an audience and critics favorite. So the flick showcases the impact of spring scenes music on a South Asian Muslim teenager growing up in England in the 1980s and features Springsteen's music from the seventies and eighties. Um, we saw, a um, trailer for it when right. we went to the movies last week and it looks it looks really cute it it kind of reminds me of those 1980s kids or, or not kids movies but teen movies sarfraz manzor thank you sarfraz i'll manzor. just have you be the the name pronouncer so i don't <laughs> yeah because i'm quite the linguist <laughs> yeah that is I? true um and blinded by the light actually will be in theaters on august 16th very cool very cool if you're a fan of Bruce Springsteen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, you know, if you're from New Jersey, how can you not You have be? to be. You're not allowed to stay in the state. That's if... like you if you live in Jersey, you can't not be a fan of Frank Sinatra, too, right? Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah. I'm he, not. He's not a fan. <laughs> yeah. He gets rather mad when it comes on the radio. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. So our last uh, little story uh, that I, I found, which I thought was kind of cool, because as you mentioned, two of our favorite 
British actors. Uh, Criminal is a new series that's going to be coming to Netflix in September, and it will be starring David Tennant and Halle Atwell. Um, so the streaming service shared that the premiere date would be September 20th, and they basically just had a couple of screenshots uh, from it. Nothing, nothing else really more about it. Um, one of the stills shows Atwell with pink hair, while another features the actress speaking to police, and another shows Tennant speaking to someone off camera. Um, so it's set entirely within the confines of a police interview suite, and Criminal, which will star David Tennant, Atwell, and a bunch of others, comes on um, September 20th. Um, it's actually going to consist of 12 episodes, and each show, um, the show will actually take place in four different countries, Spain, France, Germany, and the UK, with three episodes in each location. So basically, it'll be, you know, three episodes with one set of stars, uh, so Tennant Atwell um, will be in the UK episode. Then there's a couple of other people that are in the Germany episode, um, the Spain episode. Um, and then so basically criminal is disguised uh, or sorry, not disguised. It's described as a cat and mouse drama that explores the mental conflict between police and the suspect in, in custody. Uh, it hails actually from the Killing Eve writers. Um, so should be a, an interesting little, you know, quick moving uh, So does, does drama. this mean that we shouldn't hold out hope anymore for a revival of Agent <sighs> Carter? I don't think I so. Not. Oh, well, yeah. well, we'll have to check out the uh, the show and see. Now, are the episodes that are going to be from the other countries going to be in their native language? I don't think so. It didn't. It didn't say anything about subtitles. Or is so. everyone from every country just going to have a British accent like everything else? Well, no, they'll probably have like a Spanish accent or a German accent or you know. Well, that would be nice. Uh, yeah. But you know, most <laughs> most shows that are held in other countries use the right, English accent. Right. 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 So the people from France will have you know. Uh huh. Oh goodness. <laughs> Let's move on to our insightful picks, dear. Alrighty. <laughs> so I turn it over to you, my dear. Why? Well, thank you. So I'm pulling out an oldie. Um, so uh, so this was a show that I started watching. Uh, it was originally on BBC America. And right now, I think you can actually still find it on demand on BBC America. So if you have the app um, or uh, you might even be able to, if your cable company has uh, on demand, you might be able to find it there. Or it is actually on Amazon Prime as well. And the show is Orphan Black. Um, and there are five seasons of it. Um, so it starts out with Sarah. Isn't that not in production at this point? Yeah, it's okay. it, it's completed. It's it finished t uh, two years ago. Yeah, okay. two years ago now. Um, but it, it's one that it's funny because when I started watching it, I was like kind of half watching it, you know, not really paying attention, um, you know, to it. So it's one that I actually might even go back and start watching from the beginning knowing obviously how it how it all ends so it basically starts out with sarah who's the one of the main characters where she's kind of this streetwise woman who always has a troubled past uh she was an english orphan and bounced around from foster home to foster home and finally being taken in by mrs s uh who uprooted her and her foster brother phoenix to north america um and she made a you know, a bunch of bad decisions in her life and she's trying to do right and she has a daughter, a young daughter who's, I think she's like five at the time of, that the show starts. Um, Sarah happens to witness the suicide of Beth, who is a woman that looks exactly like her and she decides to steal Beth's identity, um, her boyfriend and money and basically start a new life for her and her daughter when she realizes that Sarah, that Beth's life was kind of in turmoil. And now that people realize, you know, think that she's Beth, 
um, you know, that there were these conspiracy theories. So now she's the new target. And that's kind of how the first season goes. And what you end up finding out is that not only was Beth looking like her, but she's actually a clone and Sarah was a clone. And you find this whole dynamic of this science company who had a bunch of clones and really everybody kind of lives in in the same kind of area, which is kind of interesting because you think you'd run <laughs> into each other, but how each different clone has a different personality. And, you know, then you find out that there's a whole separate company that was doing their own clones so you had the one company that was doing female clones and then you had the other that was doing male clones and it was basically like a power struggle you know so no spoilers huh? no spoilers <laughs> <laughs> so you know the more that that sarah you know delves into this she gets deeper and deeper into you know finding out that there's always this other level, you know, it's like you thought you knew everything and boom, something else. And you thought you knew something, you know, so I, I you know, I, I again, I started watching it the first couple of seasons and kind of got into it. And then it was like, all right. And then it was really probably by like the middle of the third, fourth season and then obviously the final season that I was really, you know, into it and, and, you know, wanted to see how they they ended it. But now it's one of those I'd like to go back and watch it, you know, from the beginning and see, right. um, you know, all the different things. So if you're into sci-fi and conspiracy theories and, you know, um, the uh, the the actress who who plays Sarah, phenomenal actress, and it's amazing because she has all of these different characters that she plays, and just the the different personas that she brings, you know, to each one. So you know, definitely a, a fantastic uh, performance by her. All right, good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week. Another shocker here is a bit of a uh, documentary. <gasps> <gasps> is it? Uh, pop culture documentary, though. This one is Rise of the Superheroes. Oh, okay. Uh, this is a story of how superheroes from Tim Burton's prototype blockbuster Batman, uh, Blade, X-Men, Spider-Man, uh, up to Iron Man and Black Panther, brought to life from the pages of comic books, first took over Hollywood, and then conquered the world through action films with larger-than-life characters. Uh, Rise of the Superheroes analyzes how superhero movies, once thought to be too campy and mainly for children, have taken over Hollywood and produced smash hit after smash hit. The documentary begins its investigation nearly 20 years before mainstream hits such as The Dark Knight or Iron Man with Tim Burton's Batman. Mm. Uh, I remember actually reading the novel of that before the movie even came out. So oh, okay. Kind of had an idea of what the movie was going to be about. Okay. Uh, so featuring established stars Michael Keaton, uh, Jack Nicholson, and Kim, B Kim Basinger uh, in the cast of Batman, the film proved that comic book movies were starting to find a foothold in mainstream culture. Uh, as the film delves into the past, uh, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, while the uh, show itself starts with Batman, mm -hmm. it really centers around where we are today with comic book superheroes mm -hmm. in the movies, where it's not comic books anymore. Right. You know, your origin started in the 30s you mm -hmm. know, and, and 40s. And, you know, like to me, the first superhero movie, the cr first credible superhero movie was 79's Superman. Mm -hmm. Um that was the the quintessential right the magic was finally there i used to be a huge fan of the old uh superman serial mm -hmm. uh, shows with uh, george reeves and you know it was campy mm -hmm. it was you know he acted it out which was funny cuz he acted as though it was like a serious drama oh yeah but you know when you see the guy jumping off a trampoline out the window you know, and you know he's going to fall. And he's not going to fly. Or, right, right. You know, someone sits there and unloads a six shooter at him, and he stands there and takes the bullets off the chest, and then they throw the gun and he ducks. Right. You know, it's. Well, and that was the thing. You always heard stories about him and how he just, 
he was the persona of it. He was taking it seriously. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't just an acting job for him. But when, know? but when you know Christopher Reeve came out and played Superman in the seventies and eighties, mm -hmm. you believed it. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, in the in the um, show, they show this one scene that's a continuous uncut scene where Superman flies in with Lois Lane, drops her on the deck, flies off. There's a knock at the door. The camera pans as she walks through the room and opens the door, mm -hmm. and he's there as Clark Kent. Wow. Still have no idea how they pulled that shot off without a cut. Mm -hmm. um, but that was what it was. I mean, when this guy flew, he looked like he was flying. Oh, yeah, yeah. The realism was there, and... As the movies, and that was before digital effects. Too. Right, right. Everything was. He was, was on all, a wire, and yeah, you know, it was all practical effects that were done mm -hmm. to to make it look so real. And then you know when Tim Burton's Batman hit, you know that one really hit home. I mean, it's hard to really look at Michael Keaton and and think of him as an intimidating person like Batman. Mm -hmm. It really is, even to this day. You know. It's hard to see him as as Batman, right? Right. Um, but what the show does is it takes you through this evolution all the way up through the new Batman movies, the new mm -hmm. Avenger movies, and everything. Um, and it's a really cool look at the evolution of superhero movies. Mm -hmm. So, Rise of the Superheroes is streaming now on Amazon Prime Video. Very cool. I will have to check that one out. Um, I think that was all we had for this week. I think it is. No afterthoughts. No afterthoughts today. Uh, we'll be back uh, next week with a new uh, podcast. I did want to put a, a shout out there for our audio listeners. You can find the video versions of these on uh, YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. And you can check out our Facebook page at... Facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. Awesome. And uh, I think we're out of here. We are. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.